And in this one, it's going to be a new song that I'm doing, so I just ask that you allow the Holy Spirit to walk through the world. Farmington is home. This place actually used to be called uh, Tota, uh, which is Navajo for three rivers because there, there are three rivers that meet here in Farmington. You have Native American cultures, you have Hispanic cultures, you have white culture, and all of them are, are blending together. Growing up Navajo and Hispanic, I mean, the, the, these are my people. So it was always going to be when I finished up my college and seminary education to come back home and to do gospel work here. 
this is a forgotten area. It's a neglected area. The Navajos are forgotten people. Um, and so there are a lot of problems here, a lot of drug abuse, a lot of alcohol abuse. And, and you combine that with poor education, high literacy, broken homes, a lot of poverty, it really creates this perfect storm. So I got hired on at a high school here. Working in the schools has really given me a unique opportunity to share the gospel with a, with a variety of students as they, as they come into my office. They know that there's someone at the school who cares about them, who they trust, who they can go and talk to. And what that has done is with our youth group, it's predominantly these, these students coming from that context that want to know more and they're hungering for more. There has to be churches for these people. So when people give, it enables us to do ministry, to do ministry effectively. The Navajo people are just like any other people. They're a people who have a proud, rich history, but they're a people who need Jesus Christ. So we're here to spread the gospel, to give the good news to a forgotten people in a forgotten place. Welcome everybody again. Uh, I hope that the you know, day has already been a good day. And I just want to make these various announcements. And uh, of course, uh, some of these announcements you already have in your bulletin. But as a matter of uh, making sure that we understand it, uh, first of all, uh, uh, we'll continue to follow the CDC guidelines and uh, make sure that the masking, the spacing, etc., is all followed. Uh, the other thing too is, uh, again, uh, as a reminder, uh, you know, you enter in the front and you drop your offering there and then as you exit, we want you to make sure that you exit from this uh, fellowship hall and if you uh, do want to uh, provide some donation or anything like that for the uh, offering, uh, please, uh, you have another place where you can drop your offering uh, envelope in at the end, uh, exit here. Uh, again, I kind of want to mention that we, so far, collected $610, but our goal at the end, by the end of April, is to have about $1,300, uh, at least reaching our goal. And so far, we haven't really uh, not made our goal every time that we had a mission offering. So I'd like to encourage all of you, uh, pray about it, uh, because as you saw in the missionary moment uh, on the screen just a minute ago, uh, the people are out there, they're serving you, and there's, we have about 4,000 of those types of missionaries serving throughout Canada and the United States. And they're trying to develop uh, uh, the interest and the love of Christ uh, during uh, this emphasis time. So again, uh, think about that. It's not about us just giving money and the government is taking half away. 100% of the offering goes to the missionary for the work that they're doing, for their salaries, and to continue to support the program. So again, please pray about it. And hopefully by the end of this month, uh, we'll reach our $1,300 goal. So again, I want to thank all of you. Because Helen read the scripture verse and it's on your bulletin too. But the emphasis on mission giving is these words in First Peter 4 10 that she read, and it's in your bulletin. It says these words Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And I think that in spite of the fact that there's this pandemic and all the problems that we have, I hope to say that we all have been blessed in a very special way. 
We're not going hungry. We're not uh, in a point where we cannot pay our bills. But the Lord has blessed us in many, many ways. So as I uh, go through our uh, emphasis on our people, uh, I'd like to mention several names here. Um, first of all, Shirley and Sarah, uh, good to see you again. It's a long time, so we're glad you're here. Uh, and then also, uh, uh, I think uh, Luke is here somewhere. Uh, anyway, I'm glad that she's here. And Yvonne, and uh, I'm not sure who else is with you, but uh, good to see you. And I uh, hope you'll continue to just join us. And the whole emphasis, too, is that we want to, uh, right now, as we start the program and as we start the in-house service, we want to invite as many people as we can so we can start to fill up and have a great sense of fellowship as we uh, meet each week. I think you also feel uh, much better to be in-house worshiping, fellowshipping, seeing each other, uh, rather than just being on watching the a video each week. So again, let me encourage you to invite your friends, family, so we can start building this up. Uh, another mention is uh, Sue, uh, of course, who will be leading us in Kentucky to be with her family uh, for about a month. So we want to pray for her and make sure that uh, she enjoys to stay in her family all well there. The other thing is uh, Dr. Reed, uh, you know, we've been talking about his cancer treatment and everything. And so far, uh, the word that I have is that he's progressing uh, fairly well, uh, but most of this is the healing process where he had surgery about two weeks ago. And uh, he seemed to be doing well, but again, it's a very uh, nebulous thing about uh, where the health situation goes. So Let's continue to pray for him. And Dr. B, if you are listening to this, uh, we just pray that you'll continue to have good days each day. Uh, again, we want to thank all of you for being here. And, uh, you know, we also have other people like uh, people in Beijing, China, that are watching this video. Uh, we have, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Karen and uh, uh, Herman Say, they're in Beijing. We have Stephen Terry, and they're in uh, Atlanta or uh, uh, Georgia. And then we have Eric, uh, 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 who is in Hong Kong. And then I have a friend uh, that's a good friend, uh, Nobu, who is from Japan. So all of these people are watching these videos from the different countries. So again, we want to continue to encourage them. One other person was uh, Kevin, he's in Kansas. So you have different people from different places actually watching the service. So again, we'd like to continue to pray for them too and encourage them. Again, thank you for being here. First Southern Baptist Church of Monterey Park, it's good to be with you today. You know, I'm amazed at how applicable and uh, right on target this, these messages are, at least these passages from God's Word are, for our current situation. Now, today we're going to talk about a topic that you see needing to be exercised every day. That's the topic of patience. Uh, well, you see people striking out at, at others. You see uh, people actually literally hitting one another because of, they've lost their patience. Uh, yelling and just uh, just such impatience with people and with situations. I, I understand we want this thing to be over, but the reality is it isn't going to be over. And we need to exercise real patience with government, with uh, uh, health of, uh, experts, with, with one another, with, with just so many things. There is so much going on right now. Uh, racial tension, political tension, uh, but patience is the thing that we need. Uh, for example, just thinking about we were so impatient. Uh, you know, we went into lockdown and we locked ourselves in and we were fairly patient with it. But then the impatience began to build. And, and so the governor felt the pressure and not just our governor, all kinds of governors felt pressure to, to get the um, 
uh, economy rolling again, so they opened it up. And the idea was that we would be patient with the process and we would take our time. But no, people just ran and, and like uh, one big party and, and, the, and the infections and, and uh, all of that spiked so much just because of the lack of patience. But you know, God's Word tells us that we can have patience. You might think, well, I'm not a patient person. That's just not my nature. <laughs> I, I'm an impatient person. I sleep impatiently. I eat impatiently. I understand, but this is a virtue that we can and we need to develop. And that's exactly what we've been looking at in this series of messages that we began from 2 Peter. We're talking about resources for facing life. Uh, life as we are facing it today. And so today I want to talk about just continuing that uh, lesson we've looked at from 2 Peter. Let's add stain with it. Endurance, patience. Let's add stain with it to our self-control. Let me just give you a recap of the message of where we've been. Remember for 2 Peter chapter 1, it starts out, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Let's just stop there. Everything we need for a godly life in the midst of a pandemic in the midst of racial tension, economic tension, everything. We have everything we need to live a right kind of life, a godly life. And it comes through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And, he, and through his glory and his goodness, he has given us great precious promises so that by them we could participate in the divine nature. We can become Christ-like having escaped the corruption in the world that's caused by evil desires. And for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. And then we begin this whole litany of what we're to be adding. And everything that we've talked about we need to add to our life is very, very point on for where we are in the middle of, of life as we're experiencing it now. Let me just give you a, a brief recap. Remember that so God has given us everything we need to face life. No ifs, ands, or buts. No, he hasn't given us everything. That's what the truth of the word says. And it tells us that we can be, we can experience an authentic life transformation that reflects God's life. Remember, God formed us in his image originally, and then sin is in our end, deformed us. But the good news is that Jesus transforms us. But our responsibility is to apply diligence and discipline. We have a participation to have, to take, um, to take hold of, in this transformation. So the passage goes on to say, for this very reason, because God's given us everything we need, because real transformation can take place, and because we have to apply diligence to it, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. And then there's this whole list, and like a, a staircase, we're aiming upwards, climbing upwards to the pinnacle of a God kind of love. A love that uh, is not invested because of what I get out of it, but because that's a, a changed nature partaking in the very nature of God himself, for God is love. So this very reason, add every, take every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance. And that's the word we're going to look at today. Uh, some would use endurance. And to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection or brotherly love. And to mutual affection, love. The pinnacle, the agape love. Four. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, there's the adding to it, in increasing measure, they'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're adding to these. Today we're going to talk about patience or endurance. There are a lot of words that can go with this. Endurance, consistency, faithfulness, steadfastness, fortitude. That's a word we don't use much, but it it, to build a fort around something, to build a protection, to keep it secure. Fortitude, solid, protective, enduring, and patience. And what we're talking about is the characteristic of a person not swerve from a deliberate purpose and loyalty to faith and holiness, even when facing the greatest trials and sufferings, stay with it. Hang tough. Stay tight. Patience. Endurance. Well, there's a lot of lessons we can learn from the scriptures. So let me just walk you through some of the scriptures about patience, because it is a virtue that we can develop, and it's necessary. It's needed, especially today. So perseverance or endurance is both a sign and a gift from God. Now, what I mean by a sign? A sign, this is, a, this is evidence 
of true conversion. It's a sign of true conversion. Matthew 24, 13 says, He who endures to the end will be saved. Those who have, are saved, who are in a relationship with God, this is the sign. They endure. They hang tough. They endure to the end. And remember that story that Jesus told about the, the man who went out and sowed the seed, and it, it, the seed was the word of God, and some of the seed fell on hard soil, and it uh, didn't take root, and or birds came and took it away, and some fell on thorny ground, but some fell on good ground. And listen to what it says in Luke chapter 8, verse 15 about that. The seed that fell on the good ground are those, those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So bearing fruit and bearing the fruit of patience, having patience is a sign God's done something in life. You've received the word of God implanted in your soul. It's taken root. It's a sign. But at the same time, it's a gift of God. It's, it's a gift of God's grace. Now, Paul tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 8, he will keep you strong to the end. Now here's the matching verse with that um, Matthew passage. Those who endure the end will be saved. And this says, God will give you the endurance so you will remain to the end. 1 Corinthians 1, 8 says, he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, patience and endurance and perseverance. It's a grace of God, a grace gift of God. And 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22 says, It is God who makes, makes us stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us. And uh, he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. We can stand. He makes us to stand. And then Colossians 1, 11. Be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so you may have great endurance and patience. Endurance and patience linked together there, but that comes by God's grace. It's a gift of God's grace. So here it is. It's both a sign and a gift. It's a sign that you are a believer, so it's possible, and it's a gift from God, so it is possible. You can do this. You can have this grace in your life. Let's go on. Perseverance also comes from the scriptures and from experience. Now, from scriptures. The scripture gives us a perspective on what God is doing in our life. So when we read God's word and we incorporate God's word, it gives us endurance because we recognize God's at work in our life, even in these hard things. Romans 15, 4 says this, Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So think about the stories of Samson and and David, and Noah, and whoever you want to pick from the Old Testament, and, and, and the stories from the New Testament as well. Those things were written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So the scriptures give us a perspective on life, and we can begin to see that it's not that the world's falling apart. God is at work. Now, I'm not saying God causes the pandemic or causes all those things. God works through that, and he doesn't waste any of those things. And we know that God causes all those things to work together for good to those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose, and we're called to be like Christ. So perseverance comes from the scriptures, but it also comes from experience. Experience is where endurance is developed. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, we rejoice in our sufferings. You think, wow, why would I rejoice in sufferings? Because here's the long look. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. There's that word. And perseverance or patience or endurance, whatever word you want to use, perseverance produces character and character gives us hope. A similar message from James says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance or perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so you'll be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So this is experience is how you get endurance, and endurance comes about through the experience. In other words, it's not just a head knowledge. The scriptures gives us an understanding of what God's doing, like these passages, but it tells us it's born out in real life. This is the testing ground. This is how patience when we pray for patience, God doesn't just zap us with some feeling. 
he gives us circumstances where this can be where it can be attempted, where it can be felt, where it can be exercised in those situations and learn how to have patience. Here's another lesson from scriptures. Perseverance is hopeful. It's not passive like, oh, oh we'll patiently wait on this one. It's, it's never that way. It's always hopeful, anticipating future, and it's active. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 says, we continually remember your work of God, uh, work before God and the Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We have this eternal perspective gained from God's word. He tells us that he doesn't waste these experiences. These are producing something in us, and it will bring praise and glory when we, re when we get in eternity. And God says, well done, my faithful servant. So patience is hopeful. This isn't just a meaningless thing. This isn't without meaning. It has great meaning. God's shaping us, and we will know about it when we finally arrive. But also, endurance doesn't happen to you. It's something you do. It's not something that God throws on you and you, oh, I feel patient now. It's something you actively do. 1 Timothy 6.1 says, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness. So get the word pursue in your mind. Run after, chase after, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. This is something we pursue. It's never passive. It's always active. We have a very active role in this. So when we pray, God, give me patience, just be ready. That there are going to be some circumstances that's going to test your patience so you can exercise it and grow in it. Now, a classic passage on endurance. In fact, it's a passage that uh, a few months ago we looked at and I did a message on this passage, but it's worth revisiting because uh, it's just so classic on about endurance. It's from that Hebrews chapter 12. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance or let us run with endurance. Let us run with patience, the race marked out for us. Let's unpack this, uh, this classic passage just a little bit using that analogy of a person running a race. Now, Christian living, living your everyday life in the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of economic downturn, in the midst of, of political upheaval, in the midst of racial tension, living the Christian life, it's like running an endurance race. And that's why the, why the writer says, let's run with perseverance the race. Now notice the contestants in this race. Let us, not you, let us. Every one of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we're the us. We're all called to run this race. When each of us yielded our life to Jesus Christ as our Lord, he entered our name in the race. I think this is something we need to be reminded of often. God doesn't call us to sit back and wait for heaven. God doesn't call us to be bench warmers or pew warmers. And how you've been running the race up to this point, you may have been running haphazardly or slowly or maybe eagerly, but somewhere along the line begin to understand this special call that I've heard to follow Jesus Christ is not a hundred meter short race. It's not even a 400 meter race. It's a marathon. It's even more than that. It's a lifelong one foot in front of the other running the race with perseverance. And this says we can run this race without losing heart and without growing weary, but we need endurance. We need patience. And we gain inspiration for this endurance from those who've run before us. Remember how this passage opens up in chapter 12, verse 1? Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. So imagine the arena, runners come in running a race, and in the stands is this great cloud of witnesses, those who have run the race before, and now they're retired and they're in the stands. They're watching and encouraging the runners. Chapter 12 follows chapter 11, 
of Hebrews, and Hebrews 11 is that hall of faithers. Those who have had faith and run the race with faith and are the example. They're the witnesses. It's not that they're witnessing us. We're witnessing them. They've finished the race and they've retired to the stands to watch us. And now we run and see them and we follow their example. This is why the scripture tells us we get great endurance and encouragement from listening to their stories, reading their stories. Now, even beyond those great hall of faithers, Abraham and, and Isaac and Noah and all those that we read about, they're just right now in our own generation, those who are even still running the race and we're inspired by them and we're following them. We, we can also gain inspiration for those who are running the race. Uh, there have been so many times nameless people that I've heard them give a testimony at a breakfast or a Bible study, and I don't remember their name now, but I remember what they said, and it challenged me. And, and I said, deep in my heart, I want to run like that. I want to be, do that. I want to follow that example. But you know, there's somebody saying that about you. You may not know this, but eyes are on you. You're a witness to somebody else, and they're seeing how you run the race. So run it with patience. Run it with endurance. You're an inspiration to others. This is why Christian fellowship is so important. And this is why small group involvement, or even in these times when we don't get together uh, that way, telephone calls and encouraging one another is so important. We're setting the pace for one another, the pace of endurance, the pace of patience. Now, the course we run, it's chosen for us by the coach because he knows what we can handle. It's a race set before us. Let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We didn't choose this race. Uh, we didn't choose our being born where we were born. We didn't choose the parents we have. We didn't choose this, this time in life, but the coach did. God did. And it's set before us. We didn't choose the course we'll run. You know, if we had our choice, we'd probably run something simple, a quick 100-meter dash, and we're done with it. Something we get over and be done, but but we don't choose the course. And God knows what we're best suited for. And he has in mind the perfect event for us to run in. So what are the situation you're in now, even as as difficult it is? It's chosen by God for you. He's the coach. He knows what you can do. He knows what you can handle. He knows the potential in you. And God will use that situation to refine you, to produce in your life the patience that you need. Now, let me give you an example of, of that value added by the, by the pressure and, the, and, and everything. Uh, around the turn of the 20th century, so 1901, a bar of steel was worth about $5. You could buy $5 a bar of steel. And when it was forged into horseshoes, it was worth about $20. But if it was forged into needles, its value jumped to $350. And then when it was used to make small pocket, blade, pocket knife blades, its worth was about $32,000. But when it was made into springs for watches, its value jumped to $250,000. But what kind of pounding and uh, that, that steel bar had to go through and endure to be worth that much? But the more it was shaped, the more it was hammered, the more it was put through the fire and pounded and polished, the greater the value. That's how it is with you. I know some of you are going through lots of fire right now and you're feeling the hammering and the pounding and the stretching, but you will come forth tempered and polished with the spring and of great value. So in this race you're running, I don't know what course God has picked out for you to complete in your life, but I do know that he's called you to your place of service and he will strengthen you you can be steadfast, you can be patient, even in that hard place. Now we run this race with our eyes on the coach. He's the perfect example of endurance. Look at this passage again from Hebrews chapter 12. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, Consider him who endured 
Now, Jesus is the coach. He's the author and perfecter of the faith. So you can imagine him down at the end of the, of the lane and we run with our eyes on him, not with our eyes on other people, not with our eyes on the stands, not with our eyes on our own feet, not our eyes on ourselves, but our eyes on him. The word that's used here, the author and perfecter, the author, uh, the word used here, it means trailblazer or author. It, it's somebody, or it can mean captain. It's somebody who is a pioneer, who's laid out a course and others follow in that. Somebody writes a book and others read that and benefit from it. Um, this is a person who leads in anything and provides an example, a predecessor in the matter. That's Jesus. He endured so much and he did it with patience and he sets the pace for us. Our coach is the perfect example. He's the one we're to imitate. In fact, the word where it talks about consider him who endured, the word consider is there is the word from which we get analogy. Uh, run like the coach did. Imitate the coach. He's the analogy to follow. He's the pattern to follow. And doing that, will never go wrong. He's the perfect example of endurance. But when we run, we must deal with endurance busters to run this race to the end. Remember, that's the sign that we run to the end. Hebrews 12, two through three says, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let's run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We have to deal with endurance busters. Things will trip us up, things that would hold us back. You know about those athletes. They run in uh, pretty skimpy stuff, pretty lightweight, no wind resistance, uh, bare minimum, because they don't want anything to trip them up. Their chew laces, they don't want to trip them up. They don't want anything to, to get in the way. And so in our life, that means often removing things that would hold us back, this tells us to remove every encumbrance, uh, like the, the bulk of excess fat, or whatever it is that gets in the way of us running this life with patience and with endurance. So the Christian runner has rid themselves of their life that trip them up. And what are those things? For you, I don't know. I do know what they are for me. And you know what? I found out what they were when I got up to run the race. As long as I was sitting on the bench, just minding my own business, I didn't know I was overweight. I didn't know those things would trip me up. I didn't know I had to take off that big heavy coat for uh, just a way to think about it. But when I started running, then I realized, oh, I got to take care of this. Ah, this is going to trip me up. I need to get rid of that. So when we get serious about living this Christian life with all the qualities that Peter outlines for us, we quickly discover what the hindrances are. It could be something physical. It could be something mental. It could be something of the spirit. It could be a physical habit that keeps you from being the witness you know you should be, or something physical that keeps you from having the energy that you could have to run this race with endurance. It could be an attitude problem or an unforgiving spirit about something in your past that you haven't forgiven about yourself or dealt with and turned over to God for forgiveness or an unforgiving spirit about someone else and you've not let that go. You just can't move beyond it. It keeps tripping you up. We have to deal with those endurance busters. Now here's a simple way to find out what they are. Look at the Ten Commandments. A simple discipline practice is to look at the Ten Commandments and ask, Lord, am I living rightly in this area? Are you the only thing in my life? Are you number one? Are you the only God? Or have I given in to idols that other priorities, um, many good things in life, but they've become the most important thing ahead of God? Our job, our career, family? Um, am I honoring God by my language and the way I speak of him and worshiping him? Am I taking the rest of this physical body uh, and focusing on him like I should? Um, am I honoring people in authority over me like I should? Am I anger and, in a sense, murdering people, Jesus said? How about my thought life, my sexuality? How about, am I stealing? A little bit here, a little bit there. These are things that trip us up. So I don't know what it is that trips you up. Coveting, uh, dishonesty. 
let the Lord speak to you and deal with it and deal with it now because everything that doesn't help hinders in this race and we want to run it well we want to run it with endurance now let me close with a, a, a paraphrased passage from another athletic metaphor uh, that uh, the Apostle Paul used in Corinthians this is from the message it's a paraphrase uh, of a person's uh, rewording it in contemporary language of what they think would re really communicate well I just listened to these words You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes race. Everyone runs, but one wins. Run to win. All good athletes train hard, but they do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. But you're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish. I'm giving it everything I've got. No sloppy living for me. I'm staying alert in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else about it, and then not being on mission myself. My Christian brother and sister, run with endurance. Live this life with patience. Let God develop that in your life. Be patient with one another. And when we do, we'll all shout together when we hear our coach say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, Peter, in this, second, in this passage of his second letter that he's written to us, he continues to remind us, if you do these things, you will never fail, and you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you adding endurance, patient endurance, sticking with it to your self-control? That's the call. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you that we have received everything we need for running the Christian race with patient endurance. Lord, forgive us from taking our eyes off of you in this race. Forgive us for complaining and griping against you, our coach, because we don't like the course you've laid out for us. Forgive us for missing practice so many times. Help us get off the bench. Help us lay aside those things that trip us up. Thank you for the example and power you grant us by your spirit to run with endurance the race you've called us to. Thank you for your assurance that we will cross the finish line in style if we simply run the race with our eyes on you. Help us turn our eyes upon you, Lord Jesus. This is our prayer in your name. Amen. Well, thanks for listening to this message. Again, let me, let me uh, encourage you be patient with one another. Be an encourager to one another. Get somebody to call this week and just ask them how they're doing. Ask them if you could pray with them. Help them along in the journey. Be patient with those who uh, you're tempted to lash out against. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Remember to be generous with your offerings and share those that your church can continue to bless the missionaries that we, uh, that we support and uh, prepare for the time when, in the future when we will gather again. It'll be different than it has ever been before, but we will gather again together. I'm praying for you daily. Let me close with a, a blessing from God's Word. This is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. May you be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully give thanks to the Father, who's qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in his, son, in his Son's kingdom of light. God's blessings on you. See you again. Bye-bye.